Hello, welcome to another episode of uh, Krishna's Agram to Zodiac. We all have come across a very tough two years and we all have this feeling that we need some sort of inspiration in our life, something positive to hear to get our days going and to face 2022. The video today, the interview I'm going to do today is with someone uh, who perfectly fits in that bill, who has seen it all, who has done it all. And I was very, very inspired when I heard the story of uh, Mr. Raymond Cook. I'm going to refer to uh, uh, Mr. Raymond Cook as uh, uncle. Um, and uh, there is a reason uh, for me to interview uncle today. Uh, you, will, you will see that. One thing I strongly believe is we all have a personal brand for ourselves. Classic example would be Usain Bolt. He has created a brand for himself. The reason I highlight that is uncle, when I think of uncle, and if you think of or if you see uncle's signature, his tagline or branding is ray of sunshine which catches me quite a bit every time I see that because that tells volumes of who uncle is and what his nature is. That is what we are going to hear from uncle today. Uh, and I'm sure you will enjoy uncle, uh, the conversation I'm going to have with uncle. Hello, uncle. How are you? Uh, very well. Thank you, Krishna. That's good. Thanks a lot for giving me the time today, uncle, to talk to us uh, on my channel. Thank you for that. No, I really appreciate you giving me the opportunity. No worries at all, Uncle. Give us an introduction of where you are today. Certainly. I'm in uh, Sydney, Australia. And uh, at the moment, of course, as uh, everywhere else in the world, there is uh, uh, lockdowns and, uh, you know, with the coronavirus and the uh, problems that it in entails. Uh, so we are all in this together. There's no such thing as uh, us and them. We are all in it together. And I feel that uh, by doing this interview, hopefully we can uh, understand each other better and what we're going for. Um, tell, tell me a little bit about uh, how your childhood was. Certainly. Well, I was born in, in uh, Calcutta, West Bengal, India. And uh, I, as a, as a young child at the age of uh, 20 months or so, I was uh, sent with my two older brothers uh, to uh, Dr. Graham's homes. You see the logo on my shirt. Uh, that tells you the pride that I have in the school that I, I went to. Uh, I was blessed in that uh, uh, people saw in me an opportunity or gave me an opportunity to uh, excel in whatever I did. And I think that uh, having gone through that experience, going at the age of 20 months, uh, not even knowing that I had parents. I was in a very bad way. I had malnutrition, I had rickets. So uh, uh, I was in a, a very poor condition. I never walked till I was about five or six years old before I even walked because of my medical conditions at the time. But I was nursed to good health and uh, a lot of encouragement, support. And I think it was the uh, background of the school and the founder of the school that made it a unique experience for all of us in that uh, no matter what uh, your status in life was, uh, you could have been the Raja's son, you could have been the beggar's son, but we all were brought up in the sense that we were all equal, no matter what. And uh, that was a wonderful experience. Uh, another thing, we never ever wore shoes in school. And one of the reasons we didn't wear shoes was so everyone felt exactly the same. The people who uh, started the foundation, started the Dr. Graham's homes, uh, John Anderson Graham, he came from Scotland and uh, he was the moderator of the uh, Church of Scotland of North India. And surprisingly, that was at that time in, in 1900, uh, when he began the school, uh, it took a lot of time and effort and a lot of cajoling and uh, you know, trying to get people to help him see this dream that he had uh, of uh, in making an improvement in people's lives, uh, especially for orphan children. And they were made to feel that uh, you know, they had no opportunity in life. And he saw that and he thought, well, I can do something with this. I can... And uh, he did. And this school was started on the 
24th of September, 1900, yes. came out of that school, have now in turn, we now uh, try our best. Many of us sponsor children that because we were given the opportunity, we now see the, the advantages of what we had, that we can now share that opportunity with other children who are less fortunate than us. And so that is why we, we ourselves, OGBs, we call them OGBs, which stands for All Girls and Boys, uh, have an organization that they've started, which is called uh, the OGB Go Adopt a Classroom Foundation, which is great because that, uh, so by us, we're not giving, just giving money for the sake of giving money. We're giving it for a specific reason. And that reason is to help educate uh, children. Typically what we say is a childhood molds a person's mind before they get into teenage or adult, adulthood. How do you see that has happened in your life? What has it done, the childhood you went through uh, when you came into teens? Because I know you have, you have moved continents as well. Tell us a little bit about that journey. Well, uh, growing up, actually, uh, we were fortunate that we grew up in uh, what was known as a, a cottage. So there were uh, girls' cottages on one side of the school and boys' cottages on the other side of the school. So there was about 500, 500 to 600 children boarding in a boarding school environment where uh, in our cottages, we had a house uncle and a house auntie that would provide our, uh, our needs, uh, sort of be it uh, love and support and someone we could go to uh, when we are uh, un, uh, unhappy or not feeling too good or having a bad day, as all of us sometimes have. And uh, it was our uncles and aunties that we called. And they were the ones who actually instilled a lot of dis. even though it was discipline and uh, it was a rigid sort of uh, environment. But I think that stood us in good stead for the future because it, we didn't uh, take anything for granted. We knew that everything we had was a blessing. And I think that's what's important uh, to share. From what you have gone through, how was it and how has it helped you or otherwise in decision making in your later years? Okay, well, that's a very interesting question because it, it sort of covers a, a quite a almost 10 years of my life in, in Dr. Graham's arms. Uh, because as a child, uh, from the age of uh, five or six, you ended up from the uh, prime, the baby cottage, you were transferred to a boys' cottage. And what happened, we had 15 older boys and 15 younger boys. Now, the older boys would then be like an older brother to you. And their job, not job, but their uh, duty as such was to look after uh, a younger charge. And, but one of the things we learned, even as a five-year-old, uh, we would earn uh, sort of, uh, just by picking up leaves, we'd have to, like our, our chores that we do every day. Uh, as, as we grow older, when you were younger, what you did was you picked up leaves, cleaned the garden, swept the front uh, veranda, uh, dusted, and things like that. So you always, no matter uh, what your state in life, you still had your chores to do. And I think that in itself, was uh, a wonderful experience, even though at times we probably, oh, why do I have to do this? But the first thing we had to do when we got up in the morning was make our bed. I mean, how many uh, kids nowadays would actually know how to make their bed? And we had to make our beds with the hospital corner, you know, on the, on the blanket. Yeah. So things like that, uh, it was just, and it became natural. Mm -hmm. So you got up, the first thing you did was you made your bed, and then we, uh, and if your duties like entail, like eventually as I grew older, my duties got more uh, serious. And of course, they ended up doing kitchen duties. I love that job. Uh, one of the uh, benefits of that job was you always had food. There was no shortage. You made sure you always had a good feed. And one of the reasons was because you had to peel all the potatoes, you had to peel the veggies, you had to cut the meat. And so it was all sort of, uh, uh, sort of uh, done in a way that gave you satisfaction and knowing that 
there was a benefit out of it as well, mm-hmm. of having to do that job, no matter how menial the job was. And even some of us, our, our jobs as we progressed, as we got older, we'd uh, end up having to help the younger boys in their uh, chores. So your responsibilities were sort of ingrained in you that you not only had to look after yourself, but you had the smallest chap there that you had to look after. Another aspect of uh, growing up as a teenager, I think was very interesting in the fact that uh, for say a birthday, a birthday present, we'd be called to the principal's office and we'd be given a tennis ball. Now that was absolutely magic. I mean, it it could have been a a 22 carat gold ball, you know, that you had holding there. And it was, and immediately you came out of there and bang, you start playing footy or whatever, you know, and enjoying it. Another thing I remember was uh, also for Christmas, we'd get little uh, packets of uh, say four lollies each, or, you know, the boiled sweets we used to have in India, good old boiled sweets. And the best one was we'd come out of there and I'd share my lolly with somebody else, you know, and I'd give him half, I'd have a bite and I'd give the other half to him. And, you know, but we were like uh, comrades in arms, if you want to put it in a term like that. So we were all buddies, you know, and we looked after each other and we cared for each other. And I think that camaraderie uh, developed as from a young age, you were taught to sort of uh, respect others treat others with respect, no matter what their upbringing, no matter what their religion or their caste or their creed or their color, you didn't even see that because each of us had our own individual uh, uh, programming. Definitely. That we were, yeah. A few things you highlighted there is discipline, responsibility and sharing. I mean, these are things we are teaching our kids every single day. And that, as you said, comes naturally because every single day you are asked to do that or expected to be performing those in your daily activities. That is that is gold, Uncle, for anyone to learn. That, that that's thing. right. That's yeah. beautiful. Uh, let's talk a little bit about uh, your Australian. Uh, how did you land up or end up in Australia? How did you land there? And your Air Force experience. I do know that you were in Australian Air Force as well. Tell us a little bit mm-hmm. about that. Well, uh, I'll, I'll, I'll share a bit of a secret first. Uh, when I was in, in India, I remember in about, I think, 1965, when uh, the Indo-Pakistan war was on, I was a young fellow then, and uh, I immediately, with the whole gang of us from the hostel, there were about 10 or 12 of us, we all decided, oh, we, we must go and fight this uh, aggression that's taking place, you know? This is our uh, duty, duty to our country. Let's go and do it. So we went along, we went and did... Uh, 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 physical training and we had to do a 10 mile run and all this type of thing and then came back and uh, after all that the fellow told me I said oh you're rejected I said why he said oh you're gonna did you know that you've got one leg that's uh, one foot that's half an inch shorter than the other I said hang on a sec I said I've never ever noticed that in my life I said but when you think about it uh, Douglas Bader he was a squadron leader in the uh, Royal Air Force during the Second World War. Uh, he had tin legs. He had lost both his legs in a flying accident, right. right? But yet he came back to actually fly aircraft and he became a fighter ace of the Second World War. Sir Douglas Bader, his name was. Right. And uh, so uh, when I told us, uh, Wing Commander, who was uh, the medical officer, I told him that, he said, ah, oh, but uh, you know, who is Douglas Bader? I said, well, I think if that's the case, we might as well forget it. <laughs> if you don't know who he is, uh, you know, sort of. But again, I was interested in uh, uh, military history and things like that. So unfortunately, uh, I never got in the Air Force in India. But quite a few of my friends did eventually, they got in the Air Force, and right. which was great. So, you know, but uh, then after that, uh, round about 1960, uh, in the meantime, I was still working in the bakery. I was doing an apprenticeship as a baker. and But I was going to school at night and studying and uh, trying to better myself because I felt, hang on, I'm not going to be a baker all my life. I've got to try and do something that's, you know, uh, going to make uh, the people that sponsored me and looked after me as a child growing up, I wanted to give them an opportunity to see that they themselves had 
uh, given me that opportunity and I was able to excel in what I did. Oh, so I went to night class and I learned shorthand and typing and things like that. And I got myself a, so as a baker or as an apprentice baker, I was getting 40 rupees a month, uh, okay. which is uh, not bad when you think about it <laughs> compared to what we had. <laughs> but anyway, uh, after uh, completing the course, I managed to uh, get another job, which uh, was working in a uh, in Calcutta, and we were doing uh, renovations for offices and things like that. And we ended up uh, working in the Australian High Commission. Right. And it was through that, that uh, meeting uh, members of the staff there, and I found them very easy going and, you know, very slack and sort of just so easy to talk to. And I thought, geez, these people are, you know, very, just so no, uh, no Putani whatsoever. You know, they're really down to earth. And uh, so one of the uh, people who were there asked me, have you ever thought of coming to Australia? And well, honestly, I had never ever thought of that. And it never struck me that that would obviously be a good opportunity. So uh, eventually what happened was, uh, uh, my brother, who had already migrated to Australia, he had come here in advance, and uh, I wrote to him and I asked him, uh, is there a good chance of me coming to Australia? And he said, yeah, why not? I'll sponsor you. And my brother, Donovan, he sponsored me and brought me to Australia.